bridge. It's the very first song. The book of Psalms was divided into five books. That's why you have book one, Psalm 1 to 41, book two is 42 to 72, book three is 73 to 89, book four is 90 to 106, and book five was 107 to 150. I will do it. <laughs> he begins with this song and incredibly ends with the last song which gives us seven imperatives often transliterated into every language from the Hebrew. It's hallelujah in the Hebrew, it's hallelujah in the Greek, it's hallelujah in Hindi, it's hallelujah in English, it's hallelujah in Arabic, it is hallelujah in German, it is hallelujah consistently through every language. They have left it as this, which basically says to praise. But it begins with this central focus in verse 1. In Psalm 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the not ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seed of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will indeed open the eyes of our understanding. In the brief time that we have as we gather as your people, oh Father, that you would open grant to us a perspective which we desperately lack. That you will root us, ground us for the sake of your son. To understand why Jesus himself will come into us. To make this our central focus. That's been your theme. Through it, we demonstrate our love for you and the obeying of it. Hide me a sinful man behind the cross. Open the eyes of our understanding as you instruct us by your Holy Spirit when we have appointed teacher in all things, the one who will bring to our remembrance the things that you have taught us. Jesus himself declared when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will take of mine and reveal it to you of what is to come. He will not speak of his own authority, but he shall go upon it. May the passion of our lives lead to the same end who was supposed to focus our Lord and Savior, which was to glorify the Father. Pray humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The word is essential if you're going to lead people to Christ. The word is essential if you are going to be made pure. Without the word of God, we are not going to be made pure. He makes it abundantly clear that He sanctifies us, cleanses us with the washing of the water by the word. That's what Paul says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified in Acts 20 verse 42. We understand the word of God is incredibly critical and central, so to speak, in terms even of our supplication, in terms of our prayer. We understand that unless we pray in accordance to his will, he will not hear us as he reminds us in 1 John 5 verse 14. If we have unconfessed sin, if we consider sinning, he will not hear us as he tells us in Psalm 66, 18. So we understand that if we are going to pray in accordance to his will, we have to pray in accordance, in conformity to his word. Why? Because he is going to accomplish his will, and he also has declared to us he is going to accomplish his word. God pours his strength into the lives of those that call upon him. I mean, is that, that's what he says in Psalm 
50 verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble and, and I will deliver thee. And thou shalt glorify me. The, the word to deliver is literally not just to rescue us from trouble, but he also pouring strength into it. And we see evidence of that in the life of Jesus when the angels come and minister to him right after he faces temptation in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. We see that in the Garden of Gethsemane where the angels, while drops, of blood mixed with sweat was falling to the ground. The Bible says God sent forth an angel to strengthen him. And it has that connotation in that word deliverance. God pouring strength into you to raise you up to bring you out of that circumstance. And we see that demonstrated in the life of Jesus. We also see that in the life of David in Psalm 1 Samuel 30 verse 6. When people are thinking about killing him, stoning him to death. Why? Because Ziklag had been raided by the Ammonites and they have taken everything that belongs to them. All the women, children, on all everything that they possessed. But the Bible says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. God brings deliverance. But when you come to Psalm 1, when for the reflection, I should actually say, this is the centrality of God's word Really, not so much for ourself or so, as much as it is for our success. Let me clarify what, what I mean by that. He tells us what it is not. He tells us what it should be. And then he reveals to us what will. What it is not. What it should be. And what will result as a consequence. That's what you have in verses 1, 2, and Three. Verse 1, the path of the believer. The path of the believer. Blessed is the man. The word is ashray. I know one of you named your children ashray and you thought it was shelter. Actually, the Hebrew word means blessed, happy. It, it, it's actually, the Hebrew word is ashray, blessed. What in the world does it mean to be blessed? We often hear pity statements, I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm blessed. But we have no concept of what that means. Because when you come to Psalm 103, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, bless all that is within me. But the word bless literally means to kneel. Now that kind of surprises us, doesn't it? Now wait a minute. What does it mean to kneel? That, that's the actual connotation of that word. Blessed in the Hebrew literally means to kneel. And you thought blessed means, oh, I've got blessings on my life. No, you just got kneelings on your life. <laughs> when you kneel, you are then saying to the one that he is greater than you are. Otherwise, you won't bend the knee. For you to bend the knee, you are acknowledging that the one you are bending the knee to has higher power, higher authority, higher rank, higher status than you do. So suddenly it changes the concept of how we understand the word blessed. But it has also in it a sense of satisfaction. Why? Because God wants us not to be dependent upon ourselves, but rather upon him because he is sufficient for us in all things. That's why Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's why God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. God is all we need. I mean, if God before us, who can be against us? I mean, you know, you read, I mean, death. We laugh in the face of death. Why? Christ has conquered death. We have to, we no longer have to fear death. Why? Because if we die, that means it is glory. We are going to be in his presence. I have never understood why Christians are afraid to die. Oh, I say, Jesus, come take me home now. Paul says, 
says, for me to live is Christ, but to die what? It is gain. And he says, and I am betwixt, I am torn betwixt the two. Which to choose? To be here on earth, which is for your benefit. To die is far better. Why? Because I am going to be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus. So here he is giving us, so to speak, the secret that if we are dependent upon him, Jesus succinctly puts that in Matthew 6, 33 and Luke 12, 31. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That he is sufficient. If you trust him, there is nothing in this life you will lack. So the path of the believer who is centered on God's word, he says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That means he is not listening to the advice. That means he does not believe what the ungodly believes. If you're, when you're walking along, now people give you advice as you're walking by the way. And he says, you don't believe like he, he doesn't walk in the same path that he was. Why? The path is directly opposite. I mean, what's it, what is repentance anyway? You're going one direction and God changes you, your direction changes 180 degrees. So there is no conformity, there is no fellowship between Christ and Belial. There is no conformity between light and darkness. So you don't believe light and God. The second thing that you find in that verse, as I said, I'm summarizing. You will have to go look up those verses. Second thing he says, he does not, nor does he walk, uh, neither does he stand in the path or the way of sinners. Now, sinners are those who are what? Missing the missing the mark. What, what is the mark? The glory of God. That's what sin is. These are constantly missing the mark of the glory of God. And he says, you not only do you not believe like the ungodly, now you don't behave like sinners. There's actually a progression. Some argue there's really not a progression. You have to look at it. There's some total. And I, I would argue it's both. There is a progression. Because you can take the counsel of somebody, you're going along life's journey and you're facing a problem, you can, or you're lost and you go ask somebody's help and direction. And it, this may happen pertaining to other things in life. But when you're standing, that means it shows that you have fellowship. I mean, have you ever found walking by and you see a group of individuals standing together? Why do they stand together? It in indicates that they know each other. There is fellowship between them. When you're walking, you can go your separate ways. Your fellowship is only as long as you're on the same path. But when you're standing, your fellowship is what? Longer. You don't want to stand around and stand just and listen to the conversation. They want to give you one ugly look if you do. Right? So he doesn't behave like sinners. But thirdly, he says, watch this, nor sit it in the seat of the scornful. Now there is a progression. The ungodly can give you ungodly advice. It, it may not be sound advice, it may not be necessarily evil. But a sinner says, do it my way. Why? Because I want you to miss the mark of the glory of God. But a scornful shakes his head and his fist at the face of God. That's what a scorner is. So if you are sinning, that means you have greater ownership in that company. So, if you're walking, if you're standing, but now if you're sitting, that means you have true fellowship in that group. Not sit up in the seat of the scornful. He doesn't belong. Why? Because there's absolutely nothing between Jesus and Satan. There's nothing between Christ and Belial. There's nothing between light and darkness. There is no fellowship. You cannot, why? If you sit among 
Scott, what, what do you think is going to happen? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communication corrupts good manners. You become the company you keep is our old adage in American lingo. You become the company you keep. You hang around people who are foul mouth, guess what's going to happen to you? You start talking like them. It impacts. It changes you. And God wants us not to have fellowship, not to associate. That's the reason why there is a separation. That's why he tells us when it comes to marriage, do not be unequally. Do not be yoked unequally. There is no fellowship. So that is the path of a guy who is centered on God's word. He doesn't believe. He doesn't behave. He doesn't belong. He has nothing to do with them. But now I want you to understand what does, what he is not, what, what he ought to be. But his delight, this is his pleasure, the pleasure of a Christian who is centered on God's word. Pleasure of the believer. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now I want you to understand, when he is talking about the pleasure of a God-centered, God and word-centered Christian, First thing, it has gathered his affection. His delight is in God's law, God's Torah, God's word. That's where he finds extreme delight in. Jeremiah says in 15, 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. I mean, I mean you, you can't imagine, I found your words and, and I just gobbled it up. Why? Because there was a joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Lord God of Sabaoth, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of armies. The delight of a child of God is in the revelation of what God himself has shown us, which points to his son, Jesus. Why? Because it is into his image he is conforming us. So if you want to know about, about Jesus, you will have to open the Bible. You have to be rooted and grounded in it. That's why he tells us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. God says his word needs to saturate our lives. His delight. Do you delight to be in God's presence? If you're delighted in God's presence, you have to delight in God's word because he reveals himself through his word. How do I know that? Watch this. John 14 verse 21. He who has my words or commandments and keeps them, he is that loveth me. I will love him, and my father will love him, and then he makes this promise, and I will make myself manifest, or I will reveal myself to him. You want to see Jesus, get in the word and do what it says. It's basically, that's what it is. It, it has to grab the affection of your heart. If it has to grab the affection of your heart, there is something seriously wrong with the profession you made that you are his child. How do I know this? 3,000 souls got saved. They get baptized, Acts 2 verse 41. The Bible says, you know what the first thing they do in Acts 2 verse 42? And they devoted themselves steadfastly to the doctrine or the teaching of the apostles. First thing. Can you imagine how much Jesus himself poured into the lives of the people? <laughs> Most people have How many of you remember Jesus spoke to a whole multitude and before he took a little boy's lunch of five dinner rolls and now when he says loaves, we're not talking about 20 ounce loaves that you get in the bakery, we are talking about oversized dinner rolls and two fishes. How many people did he feed? 
5,000 men beside women and children, the Bible says. Did you pay attention to something that happened prior to that? They had not what done what? Nay, not even a single thing for three whole days. Now you tell me, Jesus, the God who created them, should at least have an understanding of going, wait a minute. These guys need to eat. Why? Because he considered the spiritual food, the word of God, more important than their physical food. Do we hunger after God's word? Has it grabbed our affection? Whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. The word for meditate, I mean, this is, now, first it grabs your affection, now you pay attention. It's got your attention. The word literally means to mutter under your breath. Yeah, you've got people, when you tell your children to do something, that really is what that word meditate means. But when are you to meditate? Day and night. You are to meditate day and night. How do I know that? Because he says so. And in his heart, don't he meditate? Day and night. Let this book of the law not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Here, here's an incredible emphasis, isn't it? Day and night. So the pleasure of a God-centered, Christ-centered, word-centered Christian is its gladness, affection, but also its attention. And then you see the potential then of the believer. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in a season whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now the potential, he explains first is permanence. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That means it has a constant source of nutrition, constant source of Water, what it needs. It's getting the minerals from things that are in the water. As they die, they become what feeds the roots. So there is a sense of permanence by a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. It digs deep and it is stable. And that nourishes, as it nourishes the soul, God says God's word nourishes the soul of the believer. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. But not only do we see the permanence of the believer, but notice what he says, whose leaves who, uh, that bring forth his fruit in its season, whose leaves shall also not wither. Here is a person who's productive. People who are rooted and grounded in God and in his word are often very productive. Productive not only in their lives, in their own family lives, in their own selves, they're productive wherever they are at. When I can show you incredible examples of this reality, hold on a second. But also you see, and really this is the focus I want us to look at, and whatsoever he do, it shall prosper. There is the prosperity. Now I'm not talking about prosperity gospel, I'm not talking about material success here. Don't think for a moment that's what it is talking about. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Here is what leads to success. Now, bear with me as you look at some of the lives. Here is Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. God tells Joshua. Now you've got to lead these people. They have been sloppy for the past 40 years. They have grown up. They ain't fit. But you are going to lead them into battle. You have to conquer 31 kings. Number uh, in Joshua chapter 12, he lists who those kings are. 31 in all. What do you think God tells Joshua, guys who have never seen war? Most of them have been born while they were in the wilderness. Now they got to go fight. Kings mightier than them. Armies that are trained well. What do you think God 
should tell Joshua for him to get ready to conquer 31 kings. Joshua 1 the Bible says, Let this book of the law not depart from thy mouth. But I shall meditate there day and night, being careful to observe everything that is written therein. Then you will make your ways prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. God, you kidding me? I'm fighting battles and you want me to be in your word? But history records for us, doesn't it? He was so rooted and so grounded in that word. Why would God require this of Joshua? Because God was teaching him something here. He said, Joshua, all you need is me. Be dependent desperately upon me and I will bring you success. Be desperately dependent upon me. And the only way you're going to be desperately dependent upon me is when you put to practice what I have commanded you. Do you know one of the greatest kings to have lived on the face of this earth who was actually, actually conquered then the known world by the time he was 33 years old was Alexander the Great. You know how he got to be successful? With small armies that he defeated huge armies? This is going to shock you. He studied the book of Joshua and his strategies. Where did Joshua get his strategies from? God says, Oh, walk around Jericho. Once for six days, and then on the seventh day, walk seven times, and the walls will fall down. Uh, God, God, am I missing something here? I walk around. I don't say anything for six days. Seven times I'm to walk around for six times. I'm not to say something on the seventh day. But when I finish the seventh day, all they have to do is shout. Then walls which are like 18, 20 feet thick is going to just fall down. And they're going to fall inward. Really? This is going to happen if I do what you tell me. What do you see Joshua do? Precisely that. Do we trust God? I, if, if you pray, anything is what? But it depends upon trusting God, isn't it? Here comes Ezra. I'm going to for the shake of bread. Ezra is going to lead a bunch of people back to Jerusalem. They have been in captivity. First batch has gone. They rebuilt the temple. They dedicated it in 515 BC. They were taken into exile in 586. The first batch goes in 605. Second batch goes in 597. 586. Third batch goes in 582. The temple is burned to the ground. Jerusalem is left desolate. God visits as he promises them through Cyrus in 538. He, they sent out a decree in 515 BC. Finally, they rebuilt the temple and they rededicated. But by the time Ezra's time comes out, that wall is in shambles. What do you think Joshua should do? Uh, what do you think Ezra should do? Get a team of constructors, right? Uh, contractors who work well. No. The Bible says he prepared for only one thing. Ezra 7 verse 10 says, Ezra set his heart, prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And then to do it. That is, he first sought the face of God, in the law of God. <coughs> then he put it to practice in his own life. And then only he began to teach others. He enters into Jerusalem at 458 BC. And for another 13 years, he begins to implement this in the lives of the people. When Nehemiah comes in 445 BC, they build, rebuild that wall in 52 days. Now think about that for a moment. There's not a single project. I know they're building that learning center. It ain't going to be doing it in 52 days. And we have far better technology now than they did then. But you see, when you are rooted and grounded and dependent upon God, he faced enormous <coughs> obstacles, but he had a people who are what? Rooted and grounded and trained in the word of 
God. You want to be successful. God says, be rooted and grounded in my word. How successful can this be? Okay, these are biblical examples. There are many others. Honestly, there really are many others. How do you think? I have a gal who sends me a message to say, I am, I lost my husband in a terrible accident. I have taken to drinking and now I am addicted to liquor, hard liquor. We're not talking about beer here. Here was a born again Christian who professed to be and she has tried everything. Nothing worked. Nothing. This was in 1996. Nothing worked. How do I beat this? I, I said, well, I sent her back and I said, you want my advice? Take your Bible out and I want you to read the first four chapters in Genesis. And then pick up from there the next night. And she writes me back and I can barely read what you have written and you expect me to read the Bible? Yes, for my counsel. Yes, my counsel. Get into the word, and God will get that crud out of your life. She was going to prove me wrong. So next night, sends me an email. You're not going to believe. Naveen, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what happened? I was going to prove you wrong that I can read two lines. And she said, I can put the Bible down until I have read 16 chapters from Genesis, and three months later, alcohol free. Now, wait a minute. 12-step process. She had gone through rehab. She went through detox, nothing worked. That's what I said, Ms. Bauer. I got a guy in my church when I was in Illinois. The guy has gone bankrupt. His daughter is in college and he has mortgaged his house. He has paid second mortgage. It was paid for. He had two mortgages on the house. And he was struggling. His construction business went down the tubes. And he asked you, now what do I do? You got a Bible? Say, yeah. I want you to go. This is February. This is winter, mind you. Winter houses don't sell in Illinois. It's a fact of life. Get your Bible. I want you to read four chapters. And when you finish, I want you to pick up the next day from there and keep at it. He looked at me and said, are you nuts? I, read, I can give you his phone number and you can ask him. He had taking the real course exam, and he couldn't sell anything. Nobody was buying him. So that you want my counsel, here's my counsel. Get into the word, do what it says. He calls me, I mean, this was like on Monday, he calls me on Saturday and says, Naveen, you don't believe what happened. I said, what happened? I sold my first house! But I made only about 1,500, hey, it's a start. Two weeks later, he calls me. He sold a house that was worth over 400000 Now, Arana Champion is not a posh area, but he sold a house that was worth over 400000 made 24000 on that sale alone. By the time he finished the year, he was a rookie. He had sold $3.8 million worth of real estate in the first year, and he was the third highest ranking grocer in that location. He made a quarter of a million dollars. Now, wait a minute. All he did was read the Bible? Yeah, read the Bible, do what it says. Guess what? All his debts were paid. All his kids are out of college. He sent them to college and he says, hey, don't worry about scholarship. I got this cup. Why? When you delight in God, and God says, I will make your ways prosperous, I will give you success in what you put your hands to. Forward to 2006. I had come to South Carolina, I had visited my pastor, my brother, and I was heading back. I had come to Louisville, Kentucky, and I get a call, a frantic call at 8 o'clock that evening. Here was a woman by the name of Sherry, and she says, I just caught my husband on my bed with my knees. What do I do? Do I kick him out of the house? Do I throw him out? She would have been very perfectly justified because the husband had committed, and evidently they hadn't been going for two years. 
I said, Sherry, don't do a thing till I come. I'm going to leave first thing in the morning. Because it was late in the evening, there was no way I was going to be able to drive another five hours to get And it wouldn't have done any good anyway. I said, I want you and your husband to meet with me in my study at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. This was Saturday. Ted was broken. He better be. What he had done was dishonor God and he dishonored his wife in what he did. And as they sat and I began to talk with them, I began to discover things that were taking place in their lives. I said, you want my counsel? Here's my counsel. You got a Bible? I said, you got a Bible. Ted, have you confessed your sin to God and asked for his forgiveness? Have you resolved in your heart not to go in that direction? Have you asked your wife's forgiveness? I've been pleading with her all night and all day today. And I looked at Sherry and I said to her this. If you are a child of God, you have an incredible obligation to forgive your husband. Why? Because God has forgiven you in Christ. Be kind one to another and tender heart of forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And then I want you to do something. I said, Ted. It is your responsibility as a spiritual leader of the home. So I want you to take your Bible and I want you to read the first two chapters to your wife. And then I said, Sherry, I want you to read chapters three and four to your husband. They both looked at me like I am nuts. And then I said, I'm going to meet with you every single day for a week and then we're going to go to Bath every other day and then down to Twice a week now, he wants to. Other people in the set, your pastor, this is something we had to transform in our lives. Last year, they celebrated 25 years. And theirs is one of the strongest marriages in that church. Why? That's a power of God's will. Therewithal shall the young man comes his way by taking me there to according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's the power to cleanse you. What's your problem? What is the hurdle you're facing in your life? If you're a child of God, if you're a child of God, what has got your affection? What has got your attention? What has got your affection? I could tell, tell you of countless drug addicts. You won't believe how many drug addicts I've actually left to Christ. Simple solution. I don't matter whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. It doesn't matter. Here's the word. Why? Because I'm absolutely convinced what God says through the prophet Isaiah in 55 verse 11. So shall my word which goeth forth from my mouth shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. And it will prosper in the thing whereto I have sent it. That is the power of God's word. Is it any surprising that Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power Dunamis, dynamite, comes from that word. No, it doesn't blow people up. It's the dunamis of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. To the Jew first and also the Greek in verse 17 said, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, even as it is written, as it goes back at 2 verse 4, the just shall live by faith. You want to transform your marriage? You want to transform your children's lives? Get in the world with them. You want to transform your families. You want to transform your neighborhood. You want to transform your church. Get in the world. Because he says this has to be a constant delight. Because then we begin to discover who Jesus is. Because the word points to Jesus. He is the sum total of the scriptures.
He promised he would reveal himself to us. The question is, are you willing? Are you listening? More importantly, when the Bible says hear, it means to hear and obey. Hearing plus heeding is what that word hear means. I've not found anything else more powerful than that. Because I have seen not only marriages saved, and not only have I seen drug addicts, I've not only seen families restored, I have seen people, they start this and this early ago. Why did I do this? Why? Because Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what he cried. That's what putting Christ first is about. Will you be obedient to Or will you continue with your own perilous ways, wondering if there is going to be that spark, if there is going to be that joy? You want to keep your relationship with God fresh? Stay in the Word. And let the Word go through you. You will tell a different story. Why? If the Word is not in you, you don't want to. God sent in his incredible love his son. We who had sinned and she rightly deserved judgment and should perish for our sins. His made a way of his way. He poured our sins upon him and poured the wrath that we had been storing up against ourselves upon his son. And he has, with his death, reconciled us to himself and then he resurrected him so that we would be justified and that we would have life, and now he calls us to come to him humbly. Will you do that tonight? Will you come humbly and say, God, I haven't been faithful to you in your word, but today I make a commitment to you. You're not making a commitment to anybody else. You're making a commitment to him. <coughs> oh, Father, that your word will flow through me to cleanse me. Now you are clean. Because the word which I have spoken to you, Jesus said, when you cleanse the moral filth of your life, then you have to receive the meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. That's what gentle and one is. You want to be successful, not so that others will go, wow, about you. You want to be successful so that God is low. Then you will have an audience. Look at what God has done. That we have done every night. I thank you, our Father, for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for loving us with such an everlasting love. There are countless stories of many individuals in their lives here on earth where you have changed by the power of your transforming word. Because of transforming word, the written word is pointing to the living word, whose name is the word of God. He has his name written on his thigh, your word declares. Who is the Lord of Lords in the King of Kings? Or that you would grab our attention, you would grab our affection. And may you make us faithful to you as you transform us through the implanted, through the engrafted for your being. In Jesus' name.